there, I'm Rose. And I'm Jen. And we are coming to you virtually today from our nature center. We work at the Balsam Mountain Trust, a small nonprofit organization between Silva and Waynesville, where we spend part of our time working out in the forest with plants and animals that live in the wild, and the other part of our time working here at the nature center taking care of animals that can no longer live in the wild for one reason or another, and are now permanent residents here with us at this nature center. We'd like to share some of those animals with you today through our special summer reading program, The Tales in Tales. For as long as people have been sitting around campfires, they've been telling stories to explain the natural world around them. Some of the stories are thousands of years old, but even today we still love to tell stories to explain nature, to explain the plants and animals that we see in our world. We tend to see certain animals over and over again in stories. Why is that? Are foxes really mischievous? Are owls really wise? How do different cultures around the world view animals and why? One example that includes many of our native animals is the Cherokee story of the first fire. In the beginning, there was no fire and the world was cold until the thunder sent their lightning and put fire into the bottom of a hollow sycamore tree which grew on an island animals knew it was there because they could see the smoke coming out of the top, but they could not get to it on account of the water, so they held a council to decide what to do. The big strong raven tried, but came back only with scorched black feathers. The little screech owl tried, but the smoke burned its eyes and turned them red. Now, the black rat snake tried. Let's see what we have in our cooler here. The black rat snake is an excellent climber, but also failed only singeing its body black, just like the raven. After attempts by others, the small but confident water spider managed by crafting a bowl made of silk onto her back and bringing back a single coal. And this is the story of how fire came into the Cherokee people. There's a similar story that the Choctaw tell about how the possum, the chief of all the animals, was the first to try to bring back the fire, but suffered the same fate as many of the animals in the Cherokee story. In this instance, the possum lost its once thick and lustrous tail in the flames. The Cherokee also have a story of a once beautiful possum with a thick flowing tail that lost its tail to vanity. Obviously, people thought this tale was striking enough to want to explain it in story somehow. Much like the striking physical traits of a raven, screech owl, and black rat snake. Can you think of a story to explain why possum lost its tail? Feel free to pause the video for a second and come up with your own family version of why a rat snake might be black or to explain the interesting tale of a possum. All right, everyone. How about we take a closer look at our possum, Blossom? You guys saw Blossom over by our campfire earlier. But now you can see her up a little more close and personal. So there's a lot of myths around possums. So I thought we would do a little bit of a Mythbusters game with you guys at home. So we already talked about one thing that people really focus in on when they see a possum, and that is their tail. There's so many stories about how a possum's tail became bare. But another thing that people often ask about is if possums hang by their tails. So you guys at home play with me. True or false, do possums hang from their tails? If you said false, you are correct. Even though we see cartoon possums, hanging from their tails in children's books. Possums actually do not hang from their tails. With that said, they do use them like an extra arm, kind of like a spider monkey, and it helps them to be excellent climbers. Their tails are prehensile, and they use them to wrap around branches and climb trees. Another thing that helps them be great climbers is that they have thumbs on the back of their feet. They're the only other animal outside of the primate family that has a thumb on their back foot to help them be able to climb trees. 
While Blossom's out, I'm going to be giving her a few of her favorite treats. We have blueberries and mushrooms here. Let's see if she'll eat a snack for us. Here you go, Blossom. Would you like a blueberry or a mushroom? Another myth that surrounds possums is whether or not they are related to rats. So you tell me at home, true or false, are possums related to rats? If you said false, you are correct. Possums are not related to rats at all, despite having similar looking tails. Possums are actually in their own family, the genus Didelpha, that is the only one of its kind. Um, and they are also unique in that they are the only marsupials in North America. That means like kangaroos, they raise their babies inside of pouches, which is really incredible. If you're at home and you want to take a look at your pinky fingernail, when a possum's born, it is so small it could fit on top of your pinky fingernail. The only thing that's well developed are their front claws and arm muscles. So they can crawl out of mom and into the pouch to drink their milk and to grow up bigger and stronger. All right, ready for another Mythbusters? Do possums carry rabies? True or false, possums carry rabies? If you said false, you are correct. It is extremely rare for possums to carry rabies. The reason is that their blood temperature is actually too low to carry the virus. So if you guys have possums in your backyards, then you don't have to worry about them passing along diseases like rabies to your pets. In addition, possums are not very aggressive animals. They always choose to run or to climb a tree or to even play dead if they have the option. All right, ready for another one? True or false, possums eat a lot of ticks. You said true, you are correct. Possums are one of our number one tick eaters. They eat ticks like popcorn when they can find them. So this makes them a really good neighbor to have because where we find possums, we actually find really low incidence of Lyme disease and other tick-borne illness. So possums are really excellent neighbors to have. They're not gonna pass along rabies and they're eating ticks that could potentially carry diseases passed along to humans. All right, so our last Mythbuster, true or false, possums are ugly. I would say absolutely false. I think possums are one of the cutest animals in the world and I feel so uh, fortunate to have them not only to work with the nature center here, but also in my own backyard. We hope that you enjoyed meeting Blossom today and that you will embrace any possums that you have in your backyard. Um, and invite them to be good wild neighbors. Right, Blossom? We couldn't talk about animals and stories without mentioning foxes. These guys are everywhere and not just in literature. There are fox species all over the world. Here in North Carolina, we have two species. We've got the more common red fox, which we typically think of as inhabiting grasslands and forest edges. And we have the gray fox. Very interesting because this is one of the only canine species in the world to climb trees. Foxes are unique in that all over the world, through all of these different cultures, they're almost universally regarded the same way as cunning, sly tricksters. If we look to popular culture, we see the same thing. You recognize any of these? They're almost all famous for coming up with clever solutions, outwitting the bad guys, and escaping. And this is more or less true. There are also some cultures that consider foxes to be messengers of the gods or possessors of secret knowledge. Foxes are incredibly fast, so the jump to a messenger, it's not a big leap. Let's think about some of the other characteristics of foxes, their adaptations, that might color how we are seeing them portrayed in our stories, myths, and legends. Foxes are nocturnal. They come out at night. This is a time when humans tend to feel unsafe and ill at ease. Foxes have 
to be stealthy. They don't have a pack to rely on. They're solitary animals. So sneaking is part of their survival. It's how they hunt their food. And as a smaller animal, it's how they prevent themselves from becoming prey themselves. So stealthy, quiet, sneaky, out at night, starting to get a vibe of somebody who might be less than trustworthy. But what about cunning? Let's think about their speed. Foxes are really great escape artists. They're really difficult to hunt. They're also pretty adept at getting out of traps set by hunters. Throwing all of that together, we really do start to paint a picture of an animal that we might regard as supernaturally gifted with cleverness. Add to that, that they have been known to prey on human livestock and chicken coops. So we start to see something maybe a little adversarial in our relationship to them. We sometimes think of them as bad guys when really they're just trying to survive. So are foxes really sly? Sure. They have to be sneaky to survive. Mischievous or evil? That's a human characteristic. Boom. This next creature is associated with ghosts, death, evil spirits, black magic, and sorcery in stories all over the world. And it's not hard to see why. This predator hunts silently in the night with ears sensitive enough to hear heartbeats. Its sharp claws catch its prey up without a sound, unless that is, they're calling for their territory. Did you guess the mystery animal? Was this the terrifying predator you were thinking of? In Western culture, we often associate owls with wisdom. We see them on cute little graduation cards and in kids' classrooms wearing one of those little hats. But in many cultures around the world, they're seen as bad news. There are stories from Kenya that treat owls as messengers of death. Most Native American cultures also see owls as bad omens. But that's not true of every culture. Owls are considered lucky in Mongolia and Japan. What do you think, Luna? Can you hear that? That might be where some of their bad reputation is coming from. Spooky sounds coming out at night. It's no wonder that many uh, European settlers also thought that these guys were ghosts. I mentioned that these guys hunt their prey silently, and that's because they have special feathers on the leading edge of their wing. <laughs> It's great if you want to sneak up on something in the dark. Those mice never know what hit them. So imagine you're out walking in the woods and something white and screaming is coming at you in the night and you didn't hear anything approaching. It's not hard to see how some of those stories start. So why do we think of owls as wise? Are they really smarter than other birds? The short story is no. I'm sorry to say, Luna, cover your ears. Owls aren't particularly smart. It might be better if we changed the saying to a wise old parrot. Parrots are incredibly intelligent. So are ravens, even blue jays. Owls, not so much. So why do we think that? Why are there so many stories about a wise old owl? Like a lot of things, it goes back to ancient history. The ancient Greeks associated owls with the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. So 
they became a stand-in for wisdom in a lot of their stories. We also see owls associated with wisdom in Hindu traditions. Owls are sometimes seen um, sitting with the goddess Lakshmi. And in these depictions, owls are seekers of knowledge, especially in the dark. Why do the Greeks and Hindu people make that association? It could be the large eyes and the fact that, yeah, they've got great night vision. They are seekers and they're excellent predators. Although sight is not the main way they find their food. Luna, our barn owl here, you might see is very distracted. And that's because barn owls have some of the best hearing ever tested by science. In the wild, these guys hunt by heartbeat. They can hear the heartbeat of a mouse 30 feet up in a tree with the mouse hidden under the snow. They can even tell different sized prey apart based on the heartbeat. Pretty incredible. And a superpower worth telling a story about. What kind of story will you tell about an owl? Humans have been fascinated by bears for millennia. We found depictions of them in cave paintings and have even found bones and other talismans in burial mounds dating back tens of thousands of years. Of course, the ancient Greeks thought they were important enough to name not one, but two constellations after them. In many North American indigenous cultures, bears are seen as warrior spirits, protectors, even creators, and are incredibly important to the story of the people. Today, in popular culture, we see bears depicted in a very different way. Do you see any of your favorite fictional bears pictured here? Some of these bears are protectors, even warriors, but many of them are more symbols of a carefree life, laziness, gluttony. All they think about is food, particularly honey. So which is it? Guardian spirits, protectors, warriors, or honey thieves? Let's take a look. To begin with, there are many species of bear throughout the world. And, no matter where they live, they're important to the local culture. For the most part, these bears are all omnivores, meaning they eat some meat and some plant material. You'll see this black bear skull, like us, has flat molars in the back for grinding things like acorns, berries, even grasses and roots during different parts of the year. And up front, has some pretty powerful canines for shredding through meat, maybe something like fish. They'll also use their powerful claws and sometimes teeth to tear through rotten logs and use their powerful arms and legs to turn over rocks. There have been records there, of bears Rose, turning over I'm rocks Jen, two or three times their weight in search center. of one of their favorite the prey Center's. items. A Can you small guess? Nonprofit organization between Bugs. And Nashville, where we spend part Even of our something time as large as a black bear? And, and we're talking anywhere from 130 pounds to, on the upper others. end, around 500 pounds can fill themselves up with termites, ants, and beetle grubs. One of their very favorite things. And yes, even occasionally honey. Although honey is more of a special treat. Maybe that's why people think they are so fond of it. If you see a bear eating honey, they are really enjoying themselves. So it makes sense that that would make its way into a lot of our stories. And yes, bears are powerful. I mentioned that they can turn over gigantic rocks and logs. And mother bears are incredibly protective of their young. For the most part, black bears especially don't like to be around humans. They're shy and get out of the way. But there's an exception. If a person or a pet is near one of their cubs, their demeanor changes pretty quickly. And 
that behavior change has also found its way into many legends, stories, and myths. So, the answer is, they're a little bit of both. Although to call a bear lazy would be pretty unfair. If you had to keep yourself running and you were the size of a bear, you would want to conserve your energy too. That doesn't mean they're not hard workers. They spend most of their day looking for food. And in the fall, before they enter a winter torpor, they're not true hibernators. They have to pack on the pounds, spending hours and hours and hours a day eating. So, in this case, the stories do kind of match up, if they are a little bit exaggerated. There's one more interesting thing about bears and stories. There's another trait of bears that has been creeping into the stories we tell in modern times. We see more and more books and stories about bears getting into trash or, as we saw, stealing picnic baskets. This is a really interesting change in the kinds of stories humans tell about bears, and it's a really good indicator of how our relationship as humans has changed with this species over time. As humans spread further and further into bears' territories and generate more delicious smelling waste, the way we interact with bears has changed, and so the stories we tell about bears have changed too. This is one of the sorts of things that archaeologists study. What kinds of stories do people tell about animals? And what does that say about the animals and the people telling the stories? It's an interesting change. How do you think of bears? When I say black bear, what pops into your mind? Do you have any personal stories about bears? If you live in Western North Carolina, you probably do. How did you view the bear in your right, own personal everyone. story? How about we take a closer look at our possum blossom. So we tend to have stories about animals that you are guys saw blossom over by our that campfire is not the only earlier. To tell tales about animals. No, uh, we also like to tell tales about animals more that we encounter frequently in our own so, backyards. So for example, there's a lot of myths around raccoons. So I thought we met earlier bit of around here making with you guys at home. So we already we also like to tell stories about animals that are important to really focus in on like those that we like to hunt that is their fish tail. There's so many stories about but how another reason that became bears like to tell stories about but animals are for those that, that people are often ask about to us. is so if possums with yeah, let's talk tail. about snakes. So you guys at home think cultures true see snakes as a sign of transformation in the bark because they shed their skin. But in Western culture, many stories you are correct, even though we see cars and possums. This is obviously based in part on Judeo-Christian tradition, but also possums actually do not eat from their tails. Fear that snakes said, actually they built do arm use them like an extra arm, kind of like a spider monkey. In fact, one study reveals that the vast majority of our babies will turn and away when they, they see pictures of snakes and spiders. And climb They'll trees. recoil, and another thing that helps cry, them cry, and turn their bodies away. And their thumbs on the back of their face. They're the only other For early humans, threats in the wild were a real thumb on their back foot. Help them and having a fear of snakes or spiders could be a lot out on them giving her. In North America, it is extremely rare to die from a venomous snake bite because the venom from the snakes in blossom our part of the world are not near as strong as the venom from snakes in other parts of the world. So here in the mountains of Western North Carolina, we only have two types of venomous snakes. Is whether or not they are related to rats. So you tell me at home. You said a timber rattlesnake and copper possums are related to rats. Would you like to meet one? I am saying right here in front correct. of Possums one of our two are not related to rats at all, despite having similar And she's doing tails. what this kind of Possums snake does best. In their own she is hiding in her log pile here. That she's is pretty hard the to only see. one of its kind. Um, Can and anyone tell? They are also What's unique in that they only marsupials. You said that there were two America. types of venomous snakes in Western North Carolina: timber rattlesnake and the copperhead. Do you know which one this is? If you're at home and you want to take a look at your pinky fingernail, if you said copperhead, then you'd be right. This is Penny, and we think that she is beautiful. Despite the fear surrounding them, copperheads and rattlesnakes are very important to top predators in the ecosystem. And they are very important for us to help protect. In fact, the timber rattlesnake is listed as a threatened species in our state and across most of its range because of humans killing them. If you 
you said false, you are correct. It is Just extremely remember, rare for so possums to appear you babies. Alone too. The reason is that their blood temperature is actually so Some tips for avoiding an encounter are to so flip over the ice caps for your fire in your using backyard sticks rather than reaching then them with your hands. You don't have to worry about them passing along diseases so like, like to hang out in wood piles to your pets. Also, watch for your steps, especially if going off trail are not very aggressive animals. They always and choose don't to pick run up or try to kill or to snakes. climb a tree or to even the vast majority of snake bites occur when people are trying to directly right. to ready for another one true or false so possums eat a lot snake that is also native to our region is you not said true venomous. you are correct possums are one of our number one tick eaters they eat snakes like popcorn when they can find them Guy. So this makes them a really good neighbor Many to have, you might because where we find snake. possums, we actually this find really low incidence of a red rat snake. Lyme disease so and other tick-borne illness. So possums are really excellent neighbors to have. They're not going to pass along they're rabies, corn snakes and they're eating before. ticks that could potentially corn carry corn diseases around their belly. Alright, you can so notice that they our have a similar pattern on their back as the copperhead. Possums are ugly. It almost looks like that bow tie. I would say but absolutely the corn false. snake looks different. I think if you the cutest look animals um, in the world, a little closer, closer, especially so the shape of the head, um, fortunate to have it not only to work with the nature um, center here, where also the, the shape of the head, head. the copper head. Is we quite hope that you enjoyed meeting possums today, the easiest and that you will embrace to see possums wild. that you have in your backyard. But remember, um, whether it's a venomous and snake or a non to be good wild all snakes have an important role to play in the ecosystem. And so they're important for us. We to couldn't help. talk about animals and stories um, without mentioning you to go out and look for foxes. When you're out with your These guys are everywhere um, and not just in the literature. Just like there are fox species animal, all over distance, the world. Here in North Carolina, I also we have just you, because of the fear We've got snakes, the more so common have. red fox, here, which we typically think of as inhabiting grasslands and forest edges. And we have the gray fox. Um, Very interesting time. because this is one of the only canine species in the world to climb trees. As well as foxes are unique all right. in I've that one more all over the world, through all of these different cultures, I'll give you some they're of the almost stories universally and regarded the creature or the some of its adaptations as cunning, all right. sly tricksters. This animal is revered in parts of Polynesia. As if we the look Lord to popular cultures, we and see the same thing. A great you recognize any of these? Also, in many parts of the world, they're almost all famous for coming up with clever it's solutions. It's an animal associated outwitting with the bad guys longevity, and escaping, a symbol of and old age, or a good is life. More or less and true. Wisdom. There are also some cultures that in consider parts foxes of Malaysia, to be this animal of the is gods, thought to be a secret knowledge. Or if not the animal Foxes itself, are incredibly the fast. Really, really so cool the jump to a messenger figures they make a full of leaves to banish ghosts. Let's think about some of the other characteristics This creature of foxes, is their not just wise to some. We are seeing the Yoruba people of Nigeria and, and Benin Foxes hold this animal up as not just night. wise, this is a time but when very clever trickster who can outwit Foxes those around him. He can talk his way out of any situation and can actually find a shortcut animals. to a so, problem. Sneaking is part of their and then there are those who think this animal is responsible animal, for the whole world, themselves from becoming or at least so carrying the world on its quiet, back. Sneaky, out at Have night. you guessed it yet? Starting to get We're a talking about of somebody who might turtles. be less than trustworthy. Throughout India, China, cunning? and in many Let's indigenous North American speed. cultures, Foxes are really great the turtle is thought to carry really the world to on its back. They're also this goes back to traps set by in hunters. ancient times Throwing when people together, often believed that the world was really flat and that the heavens an and the sky were a dome. We above. Might regard as so the turtle was a living cleverness. representation of that world view. Add to that, which was that sacred to many people. To the turtle helped form the world in many creation myths, so bringing up maybe a dirt and soil from the bottom of them. the primordial waters to build a home and a haven when for the really people upon its back, carrying them so, 
through the cosmos. Are foxes really sly? There is a version of this sure. story. They have to be sneaky not to just survive. in cultures throughout the world, or evil? but even that's a human characteristic out of our world, like Terry Pratchett's Disc World. Turtles are important to many cultures around the world, and it's not hard to see why. Many of the stories about turtles do call back real adaptations that the animal has. Let's meet one. This is Merlin. He is an eastern fox turtle, the state reptile of North Carolina. You can see he's got this really beautiful yellow patterned skin and a unique pattern on his shell. No two box turtles look the same. Their patterns and colors are extremely varied and can act like a fingerprint for researchers. You'll also notice his red eyes. No, not evil spirits. He's just a boy. Male box turtles have bright red-orange eyes. The ladies have a golden brown color. And we think this may be how they tell each other apart in the wild. Box turtles don't really make any kind of sound, give off any smell or pheromone. They don't really look very different on the outside. So we think eye color may be a really important identifier for them in the wild as well. You'll notice they have kind of a wrinkly, crinkly appearance in their skin, which is probably why they're often associated with longevity. But it's not just about looks. These are long-lived animals. The longest fox turtle on record lived to be 131, and other tortoises like the Aldabra and Galapagos tortoises are some of the longest lived vertebrate animals on the planet. These guys really do live a long time. As for wisdom and cleverness, I've never seen him sneak out or steal things from the kitchen, but turtles do have an incredible ability to map their home territories. Box turtles don't have a built-in navigation system like sea turtles do. They can navigate even when dropped somewhere unknown to them. Box turtles, if you take them out of their home territory, they'll know they're not home, but they won't know how to find home. However, they are exceptional at navigating their home territory. They have a really intricate inner map of good food sources, places to hide, water sources, areas for nesting. That's why it's so critical to leave box turtles where you find them. They know exactly where they need to be at any part of the day, where there's the best sunlight and shade to adjust for the weather. So these guys have it. Smarts, a long life. I've never seen him bust any ghosts, but I haven't given him the opportunity. As for protectors or warriors, he's not much for fighting, but he does come with some pretty incredible armor. A turtle's shell is part of its skeleton. It's actually their ribs and spine fused together. And this dome shape is incredibly strong. There's a reason that we see domed shapes in architecture, and it's because that round line helps distribute weight, which is great for a keystone in an arch, but also to resist the chomp of a predator. Box turtles get their name because they can seal themselves up completely. I'm gonna let him have a break and I'll show you what I mean. This little lady is our female box turtle, Hermione. She's a little bit more camera shy, but she's doing a really good job of showing off where box turtles get their name. This bottom part of the shell is called the plastron, and box turtles have a special 
hinge on theirs that allow them to seal up tight. If she were really, really scared, she could tuck her head and legs in all the way and bring the bottom lip of the plastron to the top of the carapace and be sealed in like a tank. This beautiful round shell distributes weight and force and makes them really, really strong. Now, the other thing turtles are known for is their speed. If I asked you to think about a turtle story, the first thing that might come to mind is probably the tortoise and the hare. This is one of Aesop's fables from ancient Greece. But it highlights another interesting aspect of the turtle that is also celebrated in other cultures, and that is their perseverance, their tenacity, their ability to just keep trying. In the story, the turtle, though slow, just keeps going, no matter what that pesky hare brags about. And in the end, he wins through perseverance. There are other stories, like one from ancient Mesopotamia, where a mighty warrior is defeated by a snapping turtle who won't let go of his heel. And they both fall into a pit. But that aspect of tenacity, of not letting go, that is true of turtles. For instance, when we try to help them cross the road. During the summer, a lot of turtles, especially box turtles, like this little lady, are looking for nesting sites, and that often means that they are crossing roads to find just the right spot. If it's safe to do so, feel free to stop and help them along, but always put them in the direction that they're going, because if you put them back on the other side, they're going to keep trying and trying. So all the stories that tell you that these guys are tenacious go-getters, believe them, because they are. We see turtles depicted in lots of different ways, sometimes lazy, sometimes tricksters, sometimes mutant teenagers living in a sewer learning karate from a rat. Obviously, these animals have fascinated humans for millennia. What other traits do you see in turtles that make you want to tell a story? I wish she could tell her own story. I think she'd have a lot to say. And now we encourage you to pause the video for a fun art activity. So you'll work with your family or whatever group you're with to create your very own mythical creature. All you'll need is a sheet of paper, and some markers or crayons. Even a pencil will do. So here's what you'll do. First, look around and count how many people are in your group. Today, we have three. Then you'll take your sheet of paper and fold it for the number of people you have in your group. So for us, it'll be folded into three parts. Just like this. One, two, three. And there's an element of surprise. So create your mythical creature together, one person, the first person, will be doing the head of the creature. And after they've drawn the head, they'll flip it over without the, the second person seeing what the head is that they drew. The second person will draw the body in the middle. And then, they will fold it for the third person to draw the tail. After you're done, unfold the paper together and you'll have a head, a body, and a tail. Then you can make up a story about the mythical creature you've created together. Have a bigger group or want to mix it up a little bit? Each person can have their very own sheet of paper and they each draw a head, pass the paper along, each person draws a body, pass the paper along. Each person draws a tail, pass the paper along. And then everyone can unfold their very unique creatures and make up their very own story about them. We'll be back in just a minute after our family group creates 
our mythical creature to show you what we came up with today. Can't wait to find out what it is. Okay, everyone, we're back and we have created our mythical creature. I have one of my helpers with me today. What's your name? Mary, and I'm five and a half. Would you like to introduce the animal we created today? What do we have here? A raccoon bird. A raccoon bird. Can you tell us about it? It has um, the head of a hummingbird, the body of a raccoon, and the tail of a blue jay. And the tail of a blue jay and our two and a half year old helped create our raccoon body here. We decided a few things about our mythical creature. It could come out during the daytime or at night. At night. It could drink nectar and it could scavenge. It was an excellent climber and could it fly? Whoosh! Whoosh! Right up into the air! Right up into the air and um, had some special color powers. What were those? Rainbow! Rainbow color powers. We hope that you also enjoy creating your very own mythical creature with your family or group at home. Thank you all so much for joining us for the Tales and Tales. We hope you enjoyed meeting some of our animal friends a little more up close and personal. And I hope you learned something about the stories that we've been telling and maybe even been inspired to tell some of your own. If you'd like to learn more about animal stories, myths, and legends, uh, go ask your local librarian. I think they know just where to start. And if you'd like to learn more about Balsam Mountain Trust, you can find us on our website balsammountaintrust.org, or you can follow us on Facebook. We hope to see you around soon. Bye now.